Hey, it's Alan, and I just wanted to let you know that you can now listen to the ongoing history of new music early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. The last few years have been very rough for music fans. Scott Weiland, David Bowie, Prince, and a couple dozen more have left us. 2017 has also had its share of loss. Chuck Berry, Greg Allman, Chris Cornell, and now Chester Bennington of Linkin Park. A new ongoing history show about Linkin Park is scheduled for the fall, but in light of the events of the past week, we've pulled out an older show dating back to 2008. This tells the story of Chester and Linkin Park to that point. This is the Ongoing History of New Music, the podcast edition with Alan Cross. I bleed it out, digging deeper just to throw it away. I bleed it out, digging deeper just to throw it away. I bleed it out, digging deeper just to throw it away. Just to throw it away. Just to throw it away. Linkin Park from their 2007 album Minutes to Midnight with Bleed It Out. According to the Making Of DVD for that album, that song was rewritten 838,458,503 times. Hey, that's that's what it says. And I think the original title was Accident. Anyway, welcome again. I'm Alan Cross, and this is the story of the best-selling American rock band of the 21st century. So far, anyway. Since their first album was released on October the 24th of 2000, Linkin Park has sold over 18 million albums in the U.S. and another 1.3 million in Canada. And there are all the overseas sales, which are uh, substantial. Let's go with a total of anywhere from 30 to 35 million records. The only band that has come close to posting numbers like these in a similar number of years this century is Nickelback. And like I said a few minutes ago, Linkin Park is pretty much the only group to emerge from the whole new metal thing of the late 90s, bigger and stronger. Everything with this band starts at a high school in Agora Hills, which is about 30 miles northwest of downtown Los Angeles. And the core of the group has been three high school guys, MC and singer Mike Shinoda, trumpet player turned guitarist Brad Delson, and drummer Rob Borden. They all went to Agora Hills High School, which, uh, by the way, is the same high school that gave the world Hoobastank. Brad and Rob were the first to play together in a group called Relative Degree. When they broke up, they found Mike and formed a band called Super Zero, which was eventually shortened to just Zero, and spelled with an X, by the way, and this was all while they were still in high school. When everyone graduated, they kept playing together even while enrolled in college. Brad enrolled in UCLA, where he became roommates with a bass player named Dave Phoenix Farrell, a former member of a Christian ska punk band called Tasty Snacks. They called him Phoenix because he has two big Phoenix tattoos on his back. The guy is also quite the cook, especially when it comes to the barbecue. Mike went to graphic design school, where he met a wannabe comic book artist named Joseph Hahn, who also worked on some of the special effects seen in the X-Files TV series. All four guys, Rob, Dave, Mike, and Joseph, came together in Zero. There was one known demo tape, a four-track EP released in 1997, which featured a singer named Mark Wakefield. It's him singing on the demo. This thing shows up on eBay from time to time and sells for hundreds of dollars. However, back in 1997, they couldn't give this away. Nobody cared. Zero had, uh, well, zero luck. Here's a sample of what they were doing back then. The track is called Rhinestone. A track called Rhinestone from Zero, the precursor to Linkin Park. That's from 1997. And if it sounds a little bit familiar, it's because part of the song was later included in Forgotten from the Hybrid Theory album. Anyway, back to the story. Part of the issue for Zero's lack of success was, let's be honest, singer Mark Wakefield. There were lots of rejections of those original demos. Some say as many as 50 rejections. And in the end, Wakefield got the message or got bored or something and left to become the manager of a band called Taproot. It was pretty discouraging. But it wasn't exactly a waste, because, you see, Zero had made contact with Jeff Blue, a vice president at a label called Zomba, and in March of 1999, he suggested that Zero talk to this kid named Chester Bennington. Now, at first glance, Chester Bennington didn't seem to be much of a catch. He was from a broken home, he spent the money he made at Burger King on Coke and crystal meth, and the only thing that really kept him going was a dream of being a rock star. Although his heroes were Scott Weiland of the Stone Temple Pilots and Dave Gaughan of Depeche Mode, not exactly guys whose lifestyle should be emulated. While in Phoenix, Chester became the singer of a band called Grey Days, 
but there were disagreements and Chester decided to move to LA, which is where the connection with Zero happened. They sent Chester some demos. One tape featured Mark Wakefield's original vocals, and the other was just instrumentals. Do your thing! That was the instructions. Chester wrote some new lyrics, recorded his vocals, and sent everything back. And that sealed it. He passed the audition. The group then changed their name to Hybrid Theory and began to work on new stuff, but they still could not find that record deal. In fact, they were turned down dozens of times in 1999 by both major labels and indie labels. Chester remembers playing close to 50 showcases without any interest or offers. Didn't help that Dave, the bass player, left to tour the Christian circuit with Tasty Snacks that year. But they kept at it, even deciding on another name change. Hybrid Theory became the deliberately misspelled Lincoln Park. They were inspired by an actual park of the same name in Santa Monica that they drove by almost every day, and they reasoned that it was a fairly universal name since most American towns apparently have a Lincoln Park too. The label that finally took a chance on the band was Warner Brothers, even though they had told this band to go away many, many times. But there was something different about this last nine-song demo. And their champion was, again, this dude Jeff Blue, who had quit Zomba and had moved over to Warner Brothers. But this time, Warners invested heavily in producers and contributors. Starting with raw material from that nine-track demo, they got to work with a producer named Don Gilmore. The guy hired to mix the album was Andy Wallace, the same dude that gave Nirvana's Nevermind its final sheen. It took all of four weeks to finish the record. Because Dave Farrell was off touring with his Christian band, two bass players were hired for the bottom end, and anything they didn't play was played by Brad. The lyrics and the rap parts were reworked, and so were the beats, some of them provided by the Dust Brothers production team. And finally, after all this, it was done. This song was supposed to have been called Plaster, but in the end... Lincoln Park decided to call it one step closer. The first proper Lincoln Park single, One Step Closer, which came out in the summer of 2000, and it got a critical pasting because it was well, more of the same old new metal. But to fans, there was something different here. Sure, there was rapping and scratching and screaming and big riffs and beats, but there was also much more of a pop thing going on. It was catchy while still being angry and powerful. There were three more singles from the album. Number two was Crawling. It was followed by Paper Cut. And finally, In the End. This song was based on an old poem by Chester, and it's still probably the band's biggest song. I had to Hybrid Theory was the biggest selling album of 2001. It ran up sales of about 5 million copies before the end of the year, on its way to nearly 10 million in America. Canadian sales were north of half a million. And just so they could capitalize on all this success, including the wild reception they got on the 2001 OzFest tour, as well as to buy themselves some time before the second album, Linkin Park hustled out a remix album entitled Reanimation. The songs were positioned as reinterpretations. This is a sample. This is Points of Authority, which came out as a single on July 15, 2002. Remixed and reinterpreted Linkin Park from their 2002 album Reanimation. Okay, in a second we'll move on to everything that happens surrounding Linkin Park's second album. Hang tough. You're listening to the ongoing history of new music, the podcast edition with Alan Cross. This is a special ongoing history encore presentation from 2008. It's the story of Chester Bennington and Linkin Park. The reanimation album bought Linkin Park enough time to record a second CD. And the good news is that it allowed Dave Farrell to rejoin the group on bass. But as for making a second record, well, this was a bit of a challenge because the band had more than eight years to refine material for hybrid theory, and now they had to follow up a multi-platinum debut record, the biggest selling debut rock record of the new century, with another one. Expectations were high. Work started in December of 2002, and the album was in stores by the 25th of March. They called it Meteora. The title was inspired by some monasteries in a region of Greece. 
Going back to what brung them, they used producer Don Gilmore again, who really put them through the paces. For example, he made the band work on 40 different choruses for this song. It would become the first single. Now, think about how frustrating and tiring that must have been, especially for Chester, who had to scream over and over and over again. I mean, talk about shredding your vocal cords. Meteora, the second Linkin Park album, was released on March the 25th of 2003, and within a week it sold more than 810,000 copies in the U.S. alone. It sold almost 6 million in America, almost 500,000 in Canada, and a quarter million in Australia, and it also went gold and platinum in places like the U.K., Italy, Australia, New Zealand, and Mexico, and Poland. Add it all up and you're somewhere around 13 million copies. Now, you got to keep in mind, too, that this was happening as the rest of the recording industry was seeing the beginnings of a total collapse in CD sales, thanks to file sharing and emerging digital downloads. With these kinds of numbers come power. And Linkin Park decided that they would like to use their new influence to create their own OzFest-like tour. They called it Project Revolution. The first edition was in 2002 and featured Cypress Hill and a buddy named DJ Z-Trip. The 2003 tour included Mudvayne and Exhibit, and in 2004, the thing exploded into a two-stage affair featuring ten performers, including their buddies in Corn and The Used. Linkin Park from their 2003 concert album Live in Texas. Again, this was something designed to buy the band some time. Things have been pretty crazy with recording sessions and remixes and DVDs and world tours. And by the end of 2004, Linkin Park needed a break. So they disappeared for almost four solid years. Well, they disappeared as a band anyway. To keep the creativity flowing, almost everyone went off to do their own thing. Chester Bennington went on to work with DJ Lethal, the turntablist from Limp Biscuit. Mike Shinoda found work with Depeche Mode. And once that was done, he had his Fort Minor side project, which also did very well. And then there was that Collision Course collaboration CD with Jay-Z, not to mention some charity work with everything from Asian Tsunami and Hurricane Katrina victims to participating in the Live 8 event. But was it really all about getting away from it all and recharging and exploring other creative avenues? Well, no. The real story behind the long Linkin Park hiatus. Coming up next. Now, back to the ongoing history of new music. The podcast edition with Alan Cross. Back to our encore presentation of the story of Chester Bennington and Linkin Park. This is an ongoing history archive show from 2008. Linkin Park went a long, long time between proper albums. Meteora was released on March 25th, 2003. Album number three, studio album number three, Minutes to Midnight, did not come out until May 15th, 2007. That's more than four years. Sure, there were the tours and the collaborations and the side projects and the charity events, but why did it take four years to record that third album? Huh. Record company issues. A rift had opened between the band and their management and Warner Brothers Records. And it was... It was ugly. Let me see if I can frame it. By the middle of 2005, the recording industry was reeling from the drop in CD sales as fans moved into the digital realm. Warner Brothers was under new management and was trying to cut both costs and raise money. More than 30% of the performers on Warner were cut from the roster in 2004 and 1,000 employees were laid off. So that's how they cut expenses. To raise money, Warner was working on a stock offering. They were hoping for maybe $750 million, but they found that the market wasn't biting. Again, this is in the wake of the dot-com crash. They were hoping for maybe 24 bucks a share, but no one was willing to go more than 16 So this wasn't good. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, executives were brawling with Lincoln Park, one of the label's biggest assets and one of the label's biggest sources of revenue. And Lincoln Park wasn't happy about the whole stock offering thing because of where the money, they say, would end up. They alleged that if all the cash raised, a little over 1%, which in real terms was about $7 million, was going to go to artists. 
The rest were going to executives and investors. Meanwhile, the label's credit rating had been cut to negative because of all the debt. The label shot back, calling Linkin Park a bunch of extortionists. Their position was something like this. Look, your first album was a huge hit, but everything else you've released since then has sold less and less. And now you want a $60 million advance on your third studio album? Dream on. Eventually, beyond all this posturing, the two parties got together and began negotiating. Warner countered with a $15 million advance and a 50-50 split on profits for each of the next five albums. Linkin Park said, forget it. In fact, if you don't see our way, we're going to go public and really screw up your stock market offering. And we're stopping work on our next album effective now. So you thought you were getting something in the spring of 2006? Uh Uh-uh, not now. And to press their point, Linkin Park went to the press with a statement on May 2, 2005, nine days before Warner's initial public offering. Their statement went something like this, quote, We feel a responsibility to get great music to our fans. Unfortunately, we believe that we can't accomplish that effectively with the current Warner music. And then they sued the label, saying that they wanted out of their contract, despite the fact that they had a standard seven-album deal. In other words, under the terms of their original agreement, they owed Warner another four albums. Now, when you're trying to get potential investors to buy stock in your troubled company, which operates in an industry that's having issues, this is not good. You can't have a mutiny featuring one of your biggest moneymakers. So Warner shot back. Quote, We value our relationship with Linkin Park, and we are proud of our work together since signing the band as a developing artist in 1999. While Linkin Park's talent is without question, the band's management is using fictitious numbers and making baseless charges and inflammatory threats in what is clearly a negotiating tactic. Warner Brothers Records has made significant investments in Linkin Park, and they have always been compensated generously for their outstanding worldwide success. If this sounds like an old-fashioned labor strike, you're right. On one side, the company. On the other, the worker. Or, more specifically, the worker's manager. In this case, the manager was a powerful agency called The Firm, which also runs the careers of everyone from Korn to Ice Cube to American Idol Taylor Hicks. But then a weird thing happened. In December of 2005, nine months after this feud spilled into the public, Linkin Park suddenly dropped the lawsuit. Everyone kissed and made up. What happened? Well, it looks like after a period of posturing, both sides got together, started talking, and eventually worked things out. And both sides agreed not to talk about the specifics of the truce. For example, guitarist Brad Delson was quoted as saying, quote, We're resolving our differences, and we're looking forward to putting out a record. In fact, Linkin Park started working on what would become Minutes to Midnight in November of 2005, a full month before the truce was announced. Mike Shinoda let it drop that the band had hundreds of songs in various stages of development. Weirdly, though, there was less mic on the final product than before. New metal was dead, so the amount of rapping that fans might find acceptable was uncertain. So taking the safe route, they toned it down. Mike raps on just two of the 12 songs. Super producer Rick Rubin was brought on board to help out. And after working a total of 14 months on the album, not in a row either, 14 months over three years, a single was finally released on April the 2nd, 2007. It was called What I've Done. What I've Done, From Minutes to Midnight, the third studio album from Linkin Park. It finally showed up in the stores on May 15, 2007, four years, one month, and 21 days after the release of Meteora. Now that's a long time, especially today when music, the music industry, and music fans are changing so fast. But Linkin Park fans still buy CDs, apparently. No album had a bigger week in 2007 than Minutes to Midnight. It sold 625,000 albums in the first seven days. 3.3 million were sold in the first month. And those are just the U.S. figures. By the end of the year, it had sold 4.3 million records, making it the seventh best-selling record of the year. And it was a huge seller in Canada, too. And as of this moment, it sold just under a quarter million copies. There were also 300,000 in Germany, 140,000 in Argentina, 350,000 in the UK, 350,000 in Japan, 50,000 in Indonesia, 50,000 in South Africa, 50,000 in Brazil, 150,000 in Australia, and, well, you get the idea. Worldwide, they're up to about 6 million with this record, and if any past albums are any indication, this number will continue to grow.
Shadow of the Day, the big crossover ballad from Minutes to Midnight, which was issued as a single on October the 16th, 2007. Before we wrap up, here's some miscellaneous trivia about the band. Feel free to discuss this stuff with your friends. Chester Bennington was married for the first time at age 20. This was back in 1996. That first wife was named Samantha. They had a son. They divorced in 2005, and he's since married a former Playboy model named Talinda Bentley. They have a son named Tyler. They live in Newport Beach, California, where they're still reeling from the time a superfan in New Mexico managed to steal their identities by hacking into Talinda's cell phone. I'll tell you, that's a show in itself. Drummer Rob Borden got into playing drums because when he was a kid, his mom dated Joey Kramer, the drummer for Aerosmith. Mike Shinoda has a sideline as an artist. He paints. His work has even been shown in galleries. You can check him out at MikeShinoda.com. Guitarist Brad Delson appears on stage wearing a big clunky set of headphones. Mike Shinoda apparently designed them. Not really sure what the point is. Brad never gives a straight answer, but he probably uses them as monitors so he can hear everything that's happening while the band plays. And finally, there's Joe Hahn, Mr. Hahn to some fans, the band's turntablist. He directs videos and even shot a short film called The Seed, which made the circuit of some of the smaller film festivals. There you go. Back with a few final things in just a second. More of the ongoing history of new music, the podcast edition with Alan Cross. Thanks for listening to this ongoing history of new music encore presentation from the archives. All we know at the moment is that Chester Bennington died by his own hand, a hanging, sometime before 9 a.m. Pacific time on Thursday, July the 20th. That, perhaps uncoincidentally, would have been Chris Cornell's 53rd birthday. Chester and Chris were very, very close, and Chris's death was devastating to Chester. They'd both battled drugs and alcohol and depression, as well as the craziness that comes with being in a superstar band. They were both family men, too. In short, they were kindred spirits. But in the cases of both men, they declined any further participation in this life. Like I said at the top of the show, an updated Lincoln Park program is scheduled for the fall season, and hopefully we'll have some new information to go on by then. If you'd like to reach me about anything, it's alan at alancross.ca, and my website is ajournalofmusicalthings.com. Technical production is by Rob Johnston. I'm Alan Cross. You've been listening to the Ongoing History of New Music, the podcast edition with Alan Cross. Subscribe to the podcast at iTunes and through Google Play. 